Hello and welcome to The Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Now, it's not often you get a chance to welcome a guest who can quite literally bring you the water of life. Well, Aquavitae is the product of my guest today, Drew Mackenzie smith who's sending a new page in the book of Scotland's long heritage of whisky. It's a new chapter, but one that turns out to be the very first, because his spirit has reportedly been made on the site of Lindor's Abbey since 1494. A 500-year-old story that involves monks, Monarchs and malts. Drew, welcome to the programme. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we don't need to go back to 1494, but it is, a, it is the first, isn't it, in terms of it, the, the it, whiskey story? It, it, exactly. It is it's the earliest written reference to what is now whiskey. Um, very briefly, uh, 1494 is, is the key date. Uh, it's written in the Exchequer Roll of 1494, so that's the right. King's tax records of that year. And buried very deep in this big, long document in Latin, Translated to Friar John Cor, eight bowls of malt wherewith to make aqua vitae for the king. And that's the earliest written reference to what is that. So, this is the very first whiskey in turn, well, certainly the very first recorded whiskey. Yes. So, early branding by, by French monks making exactly. this spirit for, for kings. And then here we are, 2019, and you're, you're making it for. For the mass market, in Indeed. terms of um, in terms of actually a spirit that's being sold all over the world. Quite right. Yes, it's like well, the Abbey is seen as a spiritual home of Scotch whisky because that's where the story began. We're all, it, spirit was produced prior to that, but our monks brought the skills over from France, and they brought their alchemy. They brought all sorts of things with them. But mm. for us as a business, and for me as a as an individual, it's the aqua vitae. That so, so just to just key. describe the spirit, is it whiskey or is it more than that? Um, it's, it's, legally, it's not whiskey. So with whiskey, um, we, you have to mature it for three years and a day. So until then, it's just spirit. Three years and a day, it becomes whiskey, as as we all as we all know. So what we do is we take our spirit that if we put it in a cask, we become whiskey. Our aqua vitae is pre whiskey. So, right. like the monks before us, in a sense, they have this spirit which they then infuse with plants that grow around the monastery. And it's very strong. It's the same strength of whiskey, yeah. Oh, is it really the same yeah. strength, right. I mean, the stuff in 1494 would have knocked your socks off, I should imagine. Right, and, and, and today you're, you, you built a business from mm. a site that's been in your family for, for some time, um, yes, uh, yeah. like over 100 years. Yeah, indeed, yeah. But your story started in... Auction houses of, of, of Sotheby's, was it? it um, uh, Christie's. Christie's, sorry, Christie's. the wrong one. Oh, that's yeah. a, that's yeah. a, okay, auction houses, but that's quite a journey from auctioning to becoming an entrepreneur, it, it, isn't it? It's, it's been a huge journey um, for both myself and, and, my, and my wife Helen, in a sense. We, we both worked in London, her, she in classic cars, me at Christie's. Um, and we never thought about doing a distillery ever. Lindor's has been in the family for mm. 110 years. It was always home. It was always a farm. But the distillery is a rebirth. It's new. It is. It's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's a new business. It's. It's a. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we we say sort of founded in 14 or since 1494, but there's quite a significant a gap. gap. Yes. Right. Okay. So it's a restart. Mm. Yeah. So. Yes. And in terms of. It's kind of Scotch whiskey aficionados. I mean, I mean, do they look at you as the sort of the the heresy of whiskey, or do they, are you I, part of the family? I think we like to think we're part of the family, especially part of the you know whiskey. Scotch whiskey is is a global business, and and most of our visitors actually to our wee corner of Fife are from abroad. Uh, but we're embraced by the Scotch whisky industry. We're members of the Scotch Whisky Association, which I suppose is is a big tick. You can't mm. join that unless you're a, a bona fide whisky distillery. And they dated the 500th anniversary back to Lindor, did they? In terms of the yes, actual, did. the actual anniversary. Yes, of whiskey so it all, is, is it, you, all it all stems back to this one document. Um, and I think what they did in in 1994 is is decide right, okay, that's it. You know, there, there's no earlier written record, we need to sort of put a line in the sand and yeah, fortunately zero for us, for whiskey. Exactly. Yeah. And so fortunately for us, that just happens to be in our back garden. And in terms of the idea to create a mm. business out of that heritage, I mean, you know, you've got a, a career that's taken you from auctioneering mm. to working with world class chefs to actually being part of a whiskey company to yes. actually creating your own business. Mm. Was was there a light bulb moment where you thought I'm sat on a really interesting potential idea. Yeah, the, the light bulb moment was actually when we found out, because we, we're not a whiskey family. I found out this entry when I read it on a website. I had no idea that we had this 
the, in theory, sort of pot of gold in our garden. I mean, it's been a long journey. To, that was 20 years ago, so to go from there to now producing a spirit has, has been an, another journey in itself. But the, the eureka moment was finding out, putting a message on a whiskey website, thinking, well, will people think it's a good idea or not? And the response was, was, was nuts. Really? A lot of, it, tell, tell us what, why. Well, it is, well, well, people getting thing, excited that yes, there's something so, new. Well, I met the people from Canada recently. So the first whiskey website I came across just alphabetically was Anne Quake of Canada. I just said I was thinking of maybe creating a small visitor centre. The next day I opened my emails, and this is early days of emails, the next day I opened my emails, and this tide of support, but especially from there, and it was the biggest news, I'll set the heather alight and all sorts of stuff, which was fantastic. With hindsight, with the time difference, they'd probably had a few drams when they sent it. Right, I got okay, it in the so they, so they, but, but, but I suppose it's, 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 it's a very tribal drink, whiskey, isn't it? Well, it Those is, are like, yeah, you know, Especially, yeah. I mean, I mean the traditionalists who, you know, set the rules on whiskey, I mean, I mean what do they make of Aquavitae as, a, th as, as part of that family I story? Th they accept it, I think. We, we never push it as a whiskey, as it, we will have our own whiskey, uh, in, come December. So as I say, it's three years and a day. So we've been distilling for two years. So when we become a, a grown up whiskey distiller, if you like, then we really have, have joined the gang. But we've got great support from within the industry. So I don't think people see mm. it as a kind of cheap gimmick. Uh, it's, it's a very quality product. Uh, quality price, and you've done a sense. lot of work. So, so what, what does it retail at? Sort of, it, it's, for, it's forty pounds, which right. does make it sit alongside. Okay, so it's whiskeys. competing against yeah, yeah. a lot of quality bottles it is, on, on yeah. the shelf. I mean, mm. what what, me, what makes it more than just a, a museum piece or a, or a curiosity in terms of the, the way that you market it? I think it's the, the actual quality of the spirit because we could, with the whole project, um, which has been a, a, roughly. a 10 million pound project, we could have done it for arguably a great deal less money and been a bit of a Disneyland for whiskey. We have the spiritual home of Scotch whiskey, we have William Wallace, we have all these mm. Scottish and, iconic And yet you've, you've, you've clearly said that you don't want it to become a mini Scottish Disneyland. Exactly, I read here. So, exactly. So, so why not? Well, really, what you have to remember about whiskey, it's a long term venture. So if we, if we did a gin, gins are, are great. They can be rebranded. This that happens all the time. But the, the way a whiskey distillery survives and, and gets followers is all about what's in the glass. So we can have the nicest branding. We have all sorts of stories around it. But whiskey tasting, especially in competitions, is blind tasting. So it doesn't matter if Friar John Corps mm. is in the building. It's all about the quality of the spirit. So we spent a a great deal of money using the best equipment, getting the best staff. So we could have sold ourselves short right. and done a Loch Ness Monster. But the story of, or the recent story of the Scottish win uh, whiskey industry has mm. been one of very large companies buying up a lot of brands. I mean, the story of, of small distillers, mm. I mean, that, that seems to be one that um, goes against the grain of that story, yeah. if you like. I mean, I mean are, you, are, you, are you part of a new wave of independence? I think we are. I mean, the, the, when we opened, there was, I think, 17 other new distilleries in, in, in the mix, and there's another 20 on the go now. But most of them, like our, most of the small ones, are niche businesses. So we, we're not really affected so much by the global whiskey market. So whiskey, like classic cars, like so many things, is, is cyclical. And when I started this project 20 years ago, for instance, the reason it took 20 years is when I first had this idea, the whiskey industry was in the doldrums. So trying to get that kind of investment was, was mm. very hard. Um, but because we're small, the, the, the doldrums will come and go, the ups and downs will happen, but small little niche ones like us won't really be affected yeah, so but much. You, but you mentioned you raised 10 million mm. against this. I mean, in terms of how you did that and, mm. and in terms of the, the lessons, I guess, in terms of that fundraise. Yeah. What, 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 what kind of, what made it successful? I think passion. I think I, w I was, I suppose th there's that famous thing, if you build it, they will come, etc. I think I just kind of bored people into submission and said, look, this is the spiritual home of yeah. Scotch whiskey. Did the auctioneer background I think there you? might have been some of that, yeah. yeah I'll, yes. I'll raise you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. So and so people saw it. There was a lot of money going into distilleries six or seven years ago when we were starting. So there were people looking to come into it. And I, I still have, I mean, not on a daily basis, but there's still people coming in 
saying, are you looking for investment? Um, maybe if they'd said that five or six years ago, I would have, mm. I would have embraced them, but we have investment now. Um, and we've, we're very happy. There's a lot of uh, crowdfunding projects going on around the industry at the moment, but we, we kind of like a tight ship. And we're, we're almost at the break, but trick to a good investment? I mean, you talked about you've got happy investors. I mean, I suppose performance, but what, what's, the, what's the other? I think, it, I can only speak for, for my own experience, is if you're building a whiskey distillery, have investors that like whiskey. Okay, and so like your products. It. Yes, okay. yeah, I think well, that's a big part. Right, well, we're going to go to the break, and I think that's excellent advice. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Drew about how you make yourself heard in a crowded market. We'll be right back. Welcome back. My guest today is Lindor's Abbey distillery owner, Drew McKenzie-Smith. Now, Drew, before the break, I guess we spoke about how you built the business, how you came up with the idea. But I suppose the critical question for a drinks brand is, is who drinks it? Uh, good point. Um, we, we did a lot of work into that, and um, we knew there was no point approaching you know, the crusty old colonel who'll only drink one brand. Where we find our market is, is a group called Passionate Influencers. Passionate Influencers. Okay, passionate, right. Yeah. That's, that's, what, tell them, what, what is a passionate influencer? So okay. it's, it's all very scientific. It's between 23 and 37, male or female. But the, the real point, the real person who's a passionate influencer, you, you could argue that there may be a wee bit of a, a show off as well. Because what they want to do, if they're going to a dinner party, they're going to a friend's place, they want to bring a bottle of something that no one's really had before. So they're the one that introduces it to their their peer group mm. and then their friends. So, so it's a younger, affluent yes, consumer. It is. Yep. Are they not precisely the people, though, that are waking up to the concerns about alcohol and turning off it? I mean, yeah, yeah. Is but, that attention? Well, not so much turning off it. What we find is, I mean, there are times we think we should have done a gin, we should have done a low alcohol gin and made it pink and we would have been on to something. But what people look for now, in, in all products, really, not just not just alcohol, is provenance. So they want to know where their ingredients came from. So the barley for our spirit is gr all grown mm. on our own land. So people, they almost don't mind spending a wee bit more to know the provenance of, of a product. So they get the provenance, but mm. on, on this issue though, about the kind of, a lot of the, the dangers, I guess, yeah. of, of, of alcohol. Do, do you find, is, is that changing things for for the whiskey industry? I think, think, well, I mean, dry January, all these things are, they, they are now a real thing. And, and they're not necessarily a bad thing as well. I'm not, we should never say, say it isn't, but it is now factored into your forecasts, etc. So I suppose what we feel is people are so buying So you know less. there are peaks and troughs oh, in the oh, air. Oh, oh, very much so. Yeah. And, and I think the industry now absolutely accepts that that is a, is a thing that there's huge chunks of, of the population who will give up alcohol for, for January. And then other times a year there's aspects. So, and, and I think that's a good, a good healthy thing. So we, we forecast for that. But I, I think what's also happening with the passionate influence uh, sort of generation, if you like, is they are drinking less, but I suppose where we win in a sense, they, they want premium. They don't mind yeah, pre paying premium. And, and is it also occasions? Is it kind of like... Yes, yeah, yeah it is. Dinner we, parties, yeah. what, right, yeah. okay. And in terms of, I guess, the popularising of whiskey, we've seen mm. this in many, you know, I, I can't even think of the number of, you know, sort of American box sets where yes. whiskey from Mad yeah. Men yes. to Suits to, yeah. you know, you name it. Mm. I mean, whiskey seems to be the sort of the... The, the, the sort of the alcohol of choice, I guess, of, yeah. of, of, of that box set. Um, do you get that sense that that's part of the, the cultural change, the, I guess the brand change for, I think for it spirits? Is. Yeah, I think it is. And as you rightly say, I think Mad Men was maybe the beginning of that. And then you have uh, David Beckham working with Diageo. So the, the industry has tried to get younger people involved for a long time. I think what we're seeing now that is working, because they've tried and failed, I think, for a long time, is the acceptance that whiskey should and can be, I'm not saying it should be, but it can be used in cocktails. So the highball and things like that, whereas you could argue a few years back it was seen as sacrilege if you even put an ice cube in it. Yeah, so, so you are favouring, more, what, more inventiveness? With, Ab with absolutely. Spirit. I mean, even, even when our whiskey comes out, we, we, you can't be precious about it. And I've, I've heard people in the industry who, who, who are kind of 
buying into this now. If you go into the shop and buy a bottle of whiskey, whether it's 100 pounds or 20 pounds, it's yours to do with with what you like. I mean, fair enough, you listen to, to how people say you should have it. But I think that was kind of what was holding it back, that it was seen, you know, people felt a bit embarrassed if they didn't know how to drink it. There'd be mm. someone saying, you know, your granddad would maybe tell you off. But now you see a younger generation absolutely embracing it. And, and we think that's got to be good. Do, do you get a sense also that part of this is being driven by a bit of a reappraisal of, I guess, Brand Scotland as a place to go visit, drink, eat? I mean, is that, uh, is that driving some of this? I think it is a lot. I mean, I'm always... A lot of the small companies slightly go, not head to head, but they're quite critical of the Diageos of as well. I'm not a at all, I, you know, we have we have friends in Diageo, etc. But we are kind of on the slipstream of, of people like Diageo. So for us, as a tiny company going to China and things like that, it's, it's the Diageo is opening up, and Diageo about to open a massive whiskey experience in Edinburgh. It's not even a distillery. Again. That's that's good for us. So, so that young helps people. you with your global market. Uh, absolutely. And, so you mentioned China and, yeah. and presumably the states are yeah. important global yeah. markets. And Very so, much so, but I mean, you talked about the visitor centre. I mean, mm. so people will actually take tourism trails to actually come and visit. Oh, they are. Visit the Abbey, will they? Yeah, they do. I mean, what do they find when they get there? <laughs> they find <laughs> they find a five star visitor experience. Uh, um, but it, we're very much because we have so much history. I was saying we could have done a Disneyland thing. The other thing we could have done, which some distilleries have done, is not have a visitor experience at all. Because actually, the business is fundamentally about the spirit that Lindors will be selling in three or four years' time, the whiskey that's spread around the world. But we have too much of a story not to share it. And, and if I'm being mercenary, when people come, they see we've spent a, a great deal of money on very high quality furnitures and fittings, etc. So what we like to think they think is, well, look, when the Lindor's spirit comes out, it'll, it'll be premium. Mm. It, it won't be a bit ropey. So that's the market you're playing at. It, it is, and, yeah. and of course, a lot of the a lot of the marketing you see about Scotland is, mm. you know, about driving experiences. It's about the, very much that premium end in terms of yeah. the hotels mm. and in terms of the, the food and drink side of it. How does the debate on devolution affect that? And do you think that has a, a, a an effect on English tourists in terms of the welcome they might I, expect I would, north of the border? I would hope not. I think that the, the right-thinking people are on both sides of the of the argument. I mean, I was in a bar last night and my Scottish money was, was rebuffed. Um, <laughs> but that's a, as a minor, a minor hiccup. But I, <laughs> I think whatever happens... So it's the other way around. Yes, it is a wee bit, <laughs> so we'll stop taking it. But, um, no, I think Scotland is, is great, you know, with, whether it's independent one day or not, who, you know, who knows what's, what'll happen in five years' time. But as, as a brand, Scotland is really, really growing because people want experiences now. You know, they want wide open spaces. And I think what Scotland's getting better at is playing to its strengths. Glasgow's great, Edinburgh's great. We have lots of very cool, modern things going on. But, but if I'm honest, so does Barcelona, London, Manchester, you know, you name it. What we have is whiskey. We oh. have open countryside. Dare I say we have golf? So, so play to your strengths, mm. and, and that's what we do at the Lindors. But you also you're part of a, I guess, a group of people um, who've built their careers in London, but then mm. have looked elsewhere yeah. in terms of, but maybe going home, returning. Mm. When did you get a sense that you might be an entrepreneur? I mean, did, did, was that always there, or? or... I, I don't think it, I don't think it was always there. If I'm honest, I. Um... I didn't go. I didn't go to university. I sort of faffed around for quite a while and, and did various bits and bobs. I think it just evolved. I think I suppose when I had the chance, and I think that's always been the if you if you're lucky enough to have a chance. Now finding something as big as a spiritual over Scotch whisky is a is a big chance. Mm. But in other walks of life, in my chefing career, etc., if you get a really good opportunity, you take it, and then you make. So you're the alive of it. to the fact there might be an opportunity. Yeah. But yeah. But, but at the beginning. Mm. Mm. All, all you were returning to was a family home. I mean, there wasn't a business. No, there. no, exactly. And and when I first found out twenty years ago, we did make some progress and try to raise interest and money. But there was, as I say, the business was in downturn. To the, so to the point that actually I had all, I, I gave up. It, you know, it was, a, it was a shame, but we thought, you know, it's not happening. Have to get back to the day job. Mm. And really, that's what we did. So for fifteen years in between. Uh, Helen, my, my wife and I, we looked after luxury properties. She was uh, the boss and I was the chef and we had a great 
fun doing it. But then a phone call out of the blue five or six years ago now from a friend in the industry saying, look, why, are you not, why is there not a distillery at Lindor's? Uh, so it was one of those kind of carpe diem. Right, let, let's seize give, the day. Seize the day, so, let's and, see what happens. And so you, you did seize the day. Yeah. And of course, now you're, you're back approaching mm. the London market. I mean, yeah. you're, you're in Fortnum and Mason's, I, I believe. We are, um, yes. Yeah. And uh, so, so great green grocers, I mm -hmm. guess, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're shopping there. Yes. It, it, uh, you're, 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 you're into the London market. What are you we finding are. now you're back? We, we, we're loving it. We, um, we decided to grow organically. You know, we're, we're fundamentally a small distillery in, in Fife. So there's no point us trying to launch in New York and, and even London at the, at the time. So let's, let's get into the premium accounts. So we're in Glen Eagles, Balmoral, and th that's where we see the Aquavitae working. Um, we're creeping down to Manchester, and London is, is the obvious place for us. So Fortnum's is a super, you know, so it's obviously a very, very famous, fits the Lindor's brand, we feel, and luckily they feel the same thing. They have, very importantly, have, they have a big online presence as well, because obviously not everyone can get into the centre of London. But as a as a starter for 10 for us in London, it's, it ticks all the boxes. Brilliant. And just, just as a sort of a, a final thought, if you could do it all again, would you do it differently? Most definitely. Uh, I had a full head of hair when I started this, so it's, it's, it's not all been fun and games, but uh, no, definitely I would. And we look forward to the, the big moment for us really is this coming December when the whiskey comes of, of age and then there'll be Lindor single malt maybe mid next year. Right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, Drew. Thanks very much for joining me on the show. And, and that's all we have time for for another week. And thanks to my guest, Drew McKenzie-Smith, the former auctioneer turned chef and now distillery owner, who's bringing an old idea back to life for a very new generation. And we've distilled Drew's story, one that's taken him from Sussex to Scotland, from the Lake District hotels to a Fife distillery. And if you're looking for more ideas from pioneering entrepreneurs breaking into new markets, join me again on the next Capital Conversation. I'll see you then.